Praise the Lord, everybody. Well, it's great to see you amongst all the snow, so get your skis out. All right, probably no snowmen today for sure. Well, I have a story to get us started with today. A little boy was sick on Palm Sunday and stayed home from church with his mother. His father returned from church holding a palm branch. The little boy was curious and asked, why do you have that palm branch, Dad? Well, you see, when Jesus came into town, everyone waved palm branches to honor him. So we got palm branches today. The little boy replied, ah, shucks. The one Sunday I miss and Jesus decides to show up. <laughs> well, you know, for Christians all throughout the world, today is our day to reflect. To reflect about Jesus' journey that he took over 2,000 years ago. And let's be honest, that journey changed our lives. That journey would assure our place, our spot, if you will, in heaven. But then as I think about Lent, you know, we always say that Lent's a time of prayer and, and remembering, getting the Easter baskets ready to go for those kids. But then the reality kind of strikes in our life. At least my job is to remind you about that reality. And that's the reality that all of us are almost like Judas. Now, I'm sure some of you would be upset by that comment. But let's be honest. Every single one of us have denied Christ in some way, form, or fashion in our lives. But you know, as you meditate upon that, the reality starts to set in. You mean me? I'm Judas? I haven't denied Christ. I've been a great Christian all my life. I've done exactly what that Bible says. Well, as we think about Palm Sunday and how bittersweet it is, how Jesus rode triumphantly through the city and the, the crowds would gather and they all came together and they had those palm branches. Take your palm branch, if you will, and wave it up in the air. Let's get these things going. I need, it's a little hot up here. Oh, thank you. And what I'd like you to do is take that palm branch. I want you to place it at your feet. And if you don't have one, just imagine that there's one at your feet. And I want you to think for a moment that here you are, Jesus, riding on the donkey. And you're traveling down the road and all the people are waving their palm branches and putting things down at your feet. Think about that journey that Jesus rode. Was he sitting there just taking it all in like it's some parade? Or was he sitting and thinking about his death? Was he thinking about his promise to you? Was he thinking about his father and his father's will? And that road, while it may seem triumphant, Jesus knew what was going to come. So while those palm branches were nice, all the hosannas were great, his death would soon come. Why don't you take your Bibles, if you will. Let's go over to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 at the 36th verse. And think about that palm branch sitting at your feet right now. As I read this, Luke chapter 19 at the 36th verse, I'll give you a second to get over there. Okay, hear these words. Then the crowd spread out their coats on the road ahead of Jesus. As they reached the place where the road started down from the Mount of Olives, all the followers began to shout and to sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles that they had seen. Bless the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
But some of the Pharisees amongst the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying such a thing. And he replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst out and cheer. Even the stones would burst out in celebration, knowing what Jesus was about to do. Billy Graham said this, The greatest mission field in our country today is in our local church. The people sitting already here. The greatest mission field becomes us. And it's kind of hard to swallow. Here I start my message saying, well, you're all Judas. All of us, me included. And here's Billy Graham saying, the greatest mission field, we would think it would be outside the walls, but let's be honest, it's right here. Because many of us sit and we know the word of God. We know how to say it. We know how to act within it. But what happens when the rubber hits the road. What does your personal relationship look like with Jesus Christ? You know, on Palm Sunday, we see that example taking place. All these people yelling their hosannas and their hallelujahs and wow, here he comes. Thank you, Jesus. But the reality is this. Soon, within a couple days, these same voices who were singing the hosannas and the praises would say, kill him, crucify him, put him up there, put him to death. He doesn't deserve to live. Yeah, wow, is right. The words didn't match the road that Jesus had taken. They were singing their hallelujahs and then crucify. They had religion. They missed the whole person that Jesus was because they were not committed to their faith. So how do we work through this? How do we build that relationship and to have that relationship with Christ so we don't become like them? The first thing we need to do is have a faith that is centered and rooted in Jesus Christ. Now, it sounds obvious, right? But for a lot of us, we, we miss the point. Sometimes we only turn to God when it's convenient. We turn to him when we're in sorrow, when we're in pain, when something's happened to us in our life, and that's the only time. And in fact, as that's going on, what do we say? Oh, God, help me. But when things are going well in our life, do we sing those hosannas and those praises? Or are we more worried about our grumbling and our moaning and our complaining? As I talked to the Sunday school class this morning that I lead, in all things, in all things, things counted all joy we were studying Paul and his letter to the Philippians and here he is in prison trying to tell other people about this Jesus he's in shackles he's cold but instead of complaining moaning and murmuring he's counting it all joy he's giving praise he's telling the people about the great things that Christ has done in his life. He wasn't worried about his pain and suffering because he wanted to give Jesus all the praise. Because he still had breath. He still had life. The second key is to stay committed to that relationship in Christ. When we gather on Palm Sunday, we shout those praises, right? Because it's the popular thing to do. But when we leave this place, how do we leave? Do we want to follow the popular crowd? Do we want to follow the trend of things that are going on? I even had to laugh 
yesterday while I was over at Dick's Sporting Goods. I ran into some folks of the congregation, and, you know, when you're out and about, you, you hope that you can kind of stay secret and nobody sees you. And here I am, I, I need a new pair of running shoes, and I fell to the popular market because my daughter thinks that these blue neon shoes that I have that I run in are the coolest. Well, unfortunately, the tread was wearing out already. So I was complaining a little bit to the lady because just the way the shoot felt, and she said, well, you got to give it a little bit and break it in. And I said, well, okay, I'll follow the popular crowd for the color. But you know, how committed are we in our faith with Jesus Christ? Remember, he directs your steps. When you yield your life to him, and I mean not just giving a little bit of yourself, I mean giving all of yourself. When you give all of who you are to him, and you start to actively seek him in your life, in your relationships, in all the things that you do, you will start to develop a habit. You will start to develop a trust in him that he will bring you through everything in your life. The good times and the bad. The third key. And of course, a, a good Lutheran pastor always has three things. You must be committed and never sway when you're blocked by personal trials and tribulation and crisis. At that parade, it was a trendy thing to offer their hosannas and their praises and to speak about Jesus. It would have been pretty risky. And in fact, in the days to follow and the suffering that Jesus would have, it was unpopular to tell people what they thought. But you know, when the bottom drops out in our life, sometimes we ask God why. Why did this have to happen in my life? Why? Why, Jesus, would you put this upon me? And I've heard some people say, well, God will never give you more than you can handle. But to a person who is committed to Jesus Christ, that statement is true. To a life that's rooted and grounded in God's word, to know and to understand his love for you no matter what happens in your life. God will never give you more than you can handle. But you have to be committed. You have to allow your faith to continue to grow and to grow upon that promise that Jesus had upon that cross for your life. He didn't just go to that cross and abandon us. He went to that cross to save us. He gave his life, his blood, his breath, his all for you. Is your faith casual or is it committed? Despite your sins past and present, it doesn't matter. Because Jesus hung upon that cross for you. He suffered. He died. He went there for you. And because he gave that life for you. As I asked you last week and I gave you that little story of that little boy. Who while the plate was being passed he had nothing in his pockets to give. But he took that plate right in the middle of the aisle and stood at it. And said, Jesus, I have nothing to give you but me. I give you me. So think about this week. Think about all that Jesus has done in your life. And what he sacrificed for you. Is your faith casual? Or is it committed? Because on that cross, Jesus was committed to save you.